episode number 11 of the Andrew Cause podcast. I really think that today is going to be my favorite episode that I've ever shot, and it's because I'm talking about a two to three month stretch of my journey as an entrepreneur that was extremely exciting, extremely fulfilling, and it was a path that was really unknown for a lot of entrepreneurs, for most entrepreneurs, and it was so damn exciting, and it's how to get press at an early age, how to get press for your business, how to get features about yourself, and in today's episode, we're going to talk about how to do it, how to get that magical first Forbes feature, and all the other things that go along with press, the problems, what to avoid, and how to approach it in a, a smarter way. So, Let's just get right into the beginning. When I launched the company at 18 or 19, I started doing research, obviously, as all entrepreneurs do, and I found that most companies, when they launch, they have a lot of press. And I made a really big mistake because those companies that do do that are quite big. And they're usually done by very big entrepreneurs that have experience. They have connections with those writers. They have million to, millions of dollars in funding and other, other things attached to it than just a college student coming up with a good idea. So before I launched the business, I was like, okay, for these two months that I'm waiting for the, for the actual products to get here because of the production time, I already put the order in. I was just waiting for it. I was like, okay, I'm going to try to get some press, let everyone know that this college entrepreneur is trying to address this really big problem and we're going to get a couple features to launch the business with so that I could put all of those sources on the main page of the website so that makes it look legit and kind of buzz, buzzwordy. And I did, I I researched business writers at all of the places that I read. I had magazines to Entrepreneurship Magazine, Inc., Forbes, I read Money and reached out to the right people and I didn't get any responses, zero, except for one. And then one guy, he wrote back, I believe it was from Entrepreneurship Magazine and he was basically saying, I love your story, I love what you're doing, but you have to have sales. You have to have a proven concept and you don't have that yet. When you get that, come back. And I spent about three full days just working on these emails, sending out hundreds. I think I hit maybe five to 700 emails with zero sales, I might add, and basically nothing to show for it. And I was kind of pissed, but one person did respond and they were nice enough to give me some insight. That's all I really need in business. If something doesn't work for me, I'm always like, okay, if you just tell me how to approach it properly or better the second time around so that it works, I'm extremely grateful. So I knew that I just need to put the blinders on and just focus on having a successful business and then circle back around. And one thing I should also probably add is I had a... Every, every major businessman, when you start a business, your goal is always Forbes. I had a Forbes logo on my vision board, maybe six inches above my laptop so that I could see it every single day because that was just like the, the cornerstone. That was like almost the crown of business achievements in my head at, at that time. And it kind of is. Um... So I always had this obsession with Forbes. And now that I've been in there twice as a college entrepreneur, both times were my senior year and we're going to get into the full story of that whole scenario. I know that getting into Forbes isn't if you know a writer at Forbes or if it's a family member or whatever. The way that you get into Forbes is you have a story that needs to be told. So focus on succeeding at an early age. If you have disadvantages, just know that is going to be story worthy. Whether you're starting with $100 or from your mom's basement, or if you're doing it as a freshman and you have major success within the first year, 
these are story worthy things, but just simply starting at 18 with zero sales and nothing going, no following, nothing. It's not a story that needs to be told. So focus on creating the story that people need, because the reason you're going to get featured in there is that you do something that they are like, oh, I want my audience to know about this. And the reason I got so much press is I really broke the mold that you can succeed as a college entrepreneur, which is the whole reason for this podcast. And honestly, the reason I started this podcast is no matter how many features I get, we actually have one in the pipeline for Inc. Magazine right now that's going to be going out soon. We've already done the interview. And it's basically about why college is the best time to start. But every feature, it's edited by the writer. And I don't want to wait to have someone interview me about a given topic when I can just sit down here and record it and put it out. So information that you want out there can be put out and it should be put out. You shouldn't wait for someone at Forbes or Business Insider or Huffington Post to wait to ask you a question to put it out. Put it out on social media. Put it out on IG stories. Find ways to get your message out if you really care about that. But if you just, you know, just care about those features, we're going to get into how to do all of that. But the short point that I want to make is if you want to get into these major outlets, just make sure that you have a story that needs to be told, that brings someone value, that inspires someone, that breaks the mold instead of just saying, oh, hi, I'm 18, I'm a freshman, and I want to get featured. It's it's not that simple. Um, so I made that mistake in the beginning. I spent three full days working and nothing happened. Then, like I said, I put my head down. And I worked and I focused on growing the business. As you see here, we started with just this. And once I graduated, I added all of these into a subscription box. So I, I'm always focused on driving the company forward, driving sales up, getting more followers. I knew that because my success was so in the face or in the public because it was a social media brand, I knew that it was going to make a lot of noise and it was going to appeal to writers. It was never the focus to get features. It was just, how do I grow the business? How do I get more eyeballs on it? How do I get more sales? And that's all I focused on for three years, guys. After I had that initial three days of a press run, I put my head down and I just focused on getting more sales, creating better products, creating better logos, getting uh, better content on social media, just being a better business. I didn't even think about that for once until my the second semester of my junior year. I've told this story briefly before and I had a business writing professor and I already went into this story a little bit. She'd pulled up my business in the middle of class, in the middle of the lecture, talks about it. And then in one of our office hour meetings, she asks, have you tried to go for any press? Because she was a writer for press, but not for my category. So she couldn't really help me. But she knew the writing business. She knew how to reach out to people, what to send them, how to approach them, different tactics on how to pitch your story properly. And we're going to get into that. But she opened my mind up and she was like, if you don't mind me asking, how much are you doing in sales? And I told her and she was like, okay, you have a story and you can get features. You just need to find the right people and pitch them properly. So I was like, okay, shit. The whole summer, I focused on redoing my business. So I wasn't focused, but then my senior year, I was like, okay, I, I still remember what professor told me. I need to go on a major press run because it's my senior year and that headline of college entrepreneur makes X dollars or that whole college title, I only have one year left to do it. So I had this pressure of, okay, we need to get some serious amount of press right here. And then it brings me into the list that I created. I created a list of all of the places that I thought was a good fit to be featured in. And you, you all know the entrepreneurship uh, magazine, you know, Forbes, Business Insider, MSNBC, Money Magazine, CNBC. It's, we all know these sources, okay? So they're on my list. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna go every single day and I'm gonna go into Forbes. And then I'm gonna type in entrepreneur, college entrepreneur, young entrepreneur, startup, 
um, how to succeed at an early age, just all, side hustle. I would find all of these writers that write about topics that are close to my story or within my niche, right? And I would come up with this list and then I would reach out to every single damn person on those lists. But it wasn't a mass blast. It wasn't copy, paste, copy, paste. It was, here's, here's a big tip. Here's a big secret. This is what I did and it worked really well. I, I'm sure a lot of media outlets are going to be pissed because they're going to get a lot of these if, a lot, if enough people watch this. But I would title the email, all lowercase pitch. I wouldn't put 19 year old making X amount of dollars. It was nothing along or I have this many followers, this much sales. I'm 21 years old, whatever. I didn't put any of that in the headline. I'll just put all lowercase pitch. And then in the first paragraph, I would simply acknowledge them and their work because I would research them, what they were talking about, the articles that they've written I would say, oh, I see you always cover young entrepreneurs or, oh, I see that you've written 10 times about college startups or even the educational space or why it's the best time to start in college. And I have a story that could bring value to this topic that you have been diving deep into. Things like that. Just say that you've done your research. Don't be a prick and just say, hi, I want to get featured in Forbes. How can we do that? Don't do that. So you write that you've acknowledged their work, you've seen what they're writing, and you know that your story is in good resonance with what they're writing about. Then you go into a very brief pitch. Don't make it extremely long. Just say what your business is, the sales it's doing, maybe the reach, with the idea, the, the reason behind it, how it was started. Just like, I would say maximum eight to 10 sentences, and then see what happens. A shit ton are not gonna respond to you, but a lot will. And in that journey of three months of going all in on press, I learned a lot of lessons and we're going to get into everything here. You're going to meet some people that are probably not going to write about you, but there are going to be a lot of people that see something in you and they're going to help. So I had this one guy at Boston Globe and he gave me so much damn insight. He was like, okay, we can't write about you here because you need to have an office in Boston, or you need to have some distribution in Boston or something. But I will say your pitch is good. Tweak these things and you're going to get other places. And when you do have something that has connections to Boston, we're going to do something. All right. And I was like, fuck. Okay. And then I responded to him with a few more questions that would help me get more features or how to connect better. And that's really valuable. So if someone's if someone replies to you and says, no, I, I can't write about you, but they're offering advice, ask them more questions because these are like, he's not the person that's going to write about you, but he knows how to do it. He knows how he wants to be approached. He knows how he wants to be pitched. He knows what he writes about. Really ask questions. Okay. That is extremely important. And I'm still thankful to that specific guy at the Boston Globe. And um, just find those people and ask really good questions. Another point that I want to make is you want to hit your small features first and then scale up from there. So I would say in the beginning, I didn't want to do this, but I thought that it would reasonably be right because I remember a few people from the bigger magazines that I would reach out to. They ask, could you send me... Uh, some past features. And it's not because they're trying to legitimize you or see if you're worthy of press. It's simply because in addition to your pitch, they want to see what else is written about you elsewhere so that they could gain even more about your story. And then also they don't want to write the exact same article someone else has. So they want to take a different angle. So I think it's important to get a few small ones that you know you can get so that you could also send them those. And it is good when you have other pieces of press, when you approach a big place like Forbes or Business Insider. So you hit the small ones first. For me, I hit um, the Daily Trojan first. And again, these are quick. When you find the right people, it's really, really fast. So I reached out to Daily Trojan. They like the story, of course. And you know, just being a student there, you pretty much have a 90% chance of getting in if you have your own startup and it's not something stupid. 
Um, the next day, we met at Levy Library, which is just the main library on campus. We did the interview, and the article is on the front page the next day. Very, very quick. And then same thing, um, I thought that my daily uh, newspaper where I grew up in Gwinnett County, GCO, in Georgia, I reached out to them and just said, I grew up in Gwinnett County and I started this business. And again, on the front page, the next day, I emailed the person. We had a phone call the next morning. The morning after that, it was live. And all of these have a certain amount of sales to it. So it's not just you're working for something and there's nothing to show for it. You're making sales off of pretty much every single article that's written about you, especially if it's in print. That's big. Um, so both of those are big, but those, those are two small ones that I started out with just to gain a little bit momentum. And in case someone asked for it, I could send them a link from these two sources. Okay. Now, how to get the big boys. I didn't scale up from there. So I didn't go for my school newspaper and then really small local newspapers into slightly bigger ones, like maybe home business or which I'm in, but I didn't go for the middle tier. After I got those two small ones, I went straight to the top. I went straight for the Forbes, the Business Insider, Fox News, CNN Money. I went for the big, big, big ones right away after that. And one thing that I'll say is, number one, getting those few small ones was valuable because a few people did ask for those links to other articles. And then I do want to give you guys a little tip. If you're emailing people, do not email them from your Gmail account. Use your edu email. So if you go to USC, use the usc.edu email that the school provides you because it proves to them that number one, you are a student, a current student. And number two, it's kind of a shock to their system. That's why I used it because these people are getting pitched all day, every day from companies, you know, Andrew at Brains Power or, you know, Jason at whatever your business name is. But when they see a .edu email, it's very different. And I thought that it would help at least get them to open the email because it would say pitch, all lowercase letters, and an educational email I was like, okay, I think it would create enough suspense just to open it up, just to give it a chance, just to start reading. Because I knew that if I get them to start reading, I could really slice really hard because my writing was good and my pitch was really good. So I just wanted, I, I think for you guys, it's a major tip, use your .edu email. But then let's get into how I got into Forbes magazine twice. The first time which was technically the second time, but the first interview I did was during finals week, my first semester of senior year. And we did it, um, we did an interview. It was about an hour long and it was for his podcast. And he was like, we're gonna do a podcast interview. And from that, I'm gonna ask questions that are gonna directly go into the article. So he was probing me for questions that, all interviews are the same. They ask you a whole bunch of questions, you respond, and then that's the interview. But instead, it was just filmed and po in podcast form. Uh, I think it was through Skype or something. But the problem with that was, um, this was the first week of December. So legit finals week at USC for the first semester of senior year. We're sitting there and I have finals almost every single day and smack dab in the middle I have a Forbes interview, which was insane to begin with because I was just so excited about that. I could barely focus on the finals itself. But the problem that I want to tell you guys is this interview didn't go live until the day I graduated. So on May 11th, what is that? Five, six months? That's when it went live. But I did the interview back in finals week the semester before. And I made this problem or not a problem, but I did this thing where I told my family, I was like, oh, I, I did this interview for Forbes and every single fucking week, everyone would ask me, when is it going live? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. And the problem is, is don't harass your writer on when it's going to come out. They don't owe you anything. If anything, don't scare them off with texting them or emailing them every single day. So I would just check in, kind of see what's going on. But it took a long time, a long, long time. But it did go live five months later. And 
I personally thought that it wasn't going to go through because I don't celebrate anything until it happens. That's just my personality. That's the way I am. I don't trust anything. I don't celebrate anything until it actually happens. So I kept going for Forbes. And then I ended up reaching out to another writer before the second one went live. And we had an interview the next day. And then the next week, it went live. So technically, that was my first one. And then my second one came maybe four weeks after that. And that's how we got the two quick ones. But the point is, I probably reached out to 2,000, maybe 3,000 writers total. We were in a heavy grind phase. Anyone who ever wrote about entrepreneurship, I emailed, I reached out to. But Forbes, both of my Forbes articles weren't my first big pieces of press. The biggest one was Business Insider. And there's going to be a huge nugget here that all of you need to understand. The Business Insider one I think was actually the first media outlet, big media outlet that I hit because I was like, okay, if I get maybe Huffington Post, Business Insider, and like some ones under Forbes in like LA Times, New York Times, those type of really big heavy ones, I could send those links to them, which is true. And I was like, okay, let's do Business Insider first. Let's just see what happens. And I emailed their staff writers, not the contributors. There's a big fucking difference here. A staff writer is paid by the company. So a staff writer is paid by Business Insider to write for them. You should not pay for press. If you're paying for press, there's it's not legit. I'll go into that in a second. But this was a staff writer at Business Insider. And this was my first interview outside of those little small ones that I had, right? And He was like, okay, I love your story. Let's write about it. I actually want to write three articles about you. And then he gave me the three different types. And then he was like, I just need you to go to campus and get all of these pictures. It was probably like 20 pictures. If you Google my name, Andrew Kozlowski, Business Insider, it should be the first one that pops up. And you'll see that it's basically a breakdown of my day. What Andrew does at five all the way up until midnight. What he does every single day. Extremely interesting. And I really liked his approach. But that article... I don't know what it's at now, but it was at 300,000 reads because he's a staff writer. The ones that are contributors, like the ones that I had at Forbes, got maybe 10 to 30,000 views, reads. So when you go with the staff writer, just know that that article is going to be seen by a lot more people. So if you go for anyone, I would recommend going for staff writers. Contributors aren't going to get that many eyeballs on it. And it's not really favored by the media source, okay? But regardless, the business insider, I emailed him with the pitch like I did with all the other people at Business Insider. And for some reason, he liked my story. And again, we had a phone call the next day. And then I think three days after that, because he gave me some time to get all those photos, I think I had to do them on a weekend because I needed the campus to be empty to get all the shots that he wanted sent him all the photos and it was live the next day. And then he was like, all right, great response. Let's do the second one. And then we do the second one. He sends me all the questions. We have an interview. We have a phone interview. And one thing I need to add is with Business Insider, he was like, how how much money are you making? I said the number. And then he was like, okay, my editor says that we need you to prove it. We need screenshots of, of proof. So I sent it to them. You have to prove your sales. Don't be a fake entrepreneur. Don't say that you're making a million in sales in your pitch when you're not. Because guess what? They're going to fucking ask for it. I, I wasn't mad about this because what I said I could prove. And I sent it to him. He forwarded it to the editor. And the article went live. So they are going to double check you. So don't be a bullshitter here, okay? But it went live. The response was great. Again, I think it was 10,000 in sale in a single day, 10,000 more followers in 48 hours, tons of response to the business and my personal brand. It was crazy. That was my first big feature was Business Insider. And I'm so grateful for Business Insider and Harrison for starting that ball rolling. But one thing that I want to say is as soon as I got that, I was like, okay, I, I always had this theory of your first one is the hardest because I knew that once you get a big player 
And this was a legit one because it was a staff writer, not a contributor. It's not some bullshit that you pay for. This is legit. Um, And also, if you ever have to pay a writer, it's not legit. Real staff writers and real writers for Forbes, Business Insider, all these other things are not going to ask you for payment. They're not going to ask for $1,000. They write because that's their job. They're paid by Business Insider to write good stories. Okay? I never paid a cent for any of these features. But we're going to get into a few problems about paying for press in, in a little second. But we didn't pay for anything. We did the interview. It went live. And then I knew as soon as I had that business insider, I was like, okay, now I'm going to take this business insider article at that point articles because the second one went up, I think, three, five days after that. We went and I went to Forbes and I said, this week... I was just featured in Business Insider twice with this story, links below, and then I'd go into my pitch. Again, still saying, I I love your writing, I love this article about whatever, I see that you always write about X type of entrepreneurs and I fit into that mold, but I still had that proof, those two links to Business Insider with a staff writer at the bottom, and that was a major pitch. Because when you're written about in big articles, it legitimizes them and it doesn't make them feel like they're at risk to write about you, okay? Because I remember when I had an interview with the LA Times, they said, well, fuck, we don't write about people as young as you, but you've been in Forbes twice, so it's not as risky to write about you. And he was like, that's a big deal. And I was like, so you don't think uh, I would even have this interview if I hadn't been in Forbes multiple times in Business Insider? And he was like, no way. So it is important to get some of them and it's just a good sales point and it makes them feel less risky to write about you because you've been in other major outlets. So Business Insider was a huge shift for me and how I thought about press and it changed how I approached press moving forward. So you leverage the pieces that you already have to get more especially with bigger outlets than the ones you've been in. Which brings me into the importance of going to a staff writer versus a contributor. A staff writer, again, is paid by the magazine, by the publication, so they're going to get a lot more eyeballs. You have a higher chance on being trending and the actual website or publication pushing that specific piece. It's just going to get more eyeballs. So if you want to get the legit way, you're going to go with staff writers. But contributors, it isn't bad. Both of the Forbes articles were with contributors. They might ask for something in return, whether it is to be a guest on their podcast or some of them might ask you for money. I wouldn't recommend going with people like that because, again, we're going to get into that in a second. But contributors can also be snobby for no reason because... I reached out to one of the contributors at, I believe it was Forbes, after I got my Business Insider features, because remember, I got those two, and then I immediately pivoted to Forbes to get some, and basically, she was bas- she said, oh, we can't write about you because that's our rival, and we, don't, we cover news that they don't, which was complete bullshit. She didn't know what the fuck she was talking about, because I went to that Boston Globe guy. And I went to the guys that actually did not write about me, but they supported me and they gave me information on the process and how to do things. And they're just like, yeah, that's just bullshit. She's just being snobby for absolutely no reason. So you're going to get some people that are quite frankly, fucking assholes throughout this whole process. But don't let that discourage you from, from keep chugging away. Again, thousands of emails, thousands of outreach, connecting with thousands of people, you, the chances are of running into an asshole are pretty damn high. And I definitely ran into a few. One of them was from the Atlanta Business Journal. Um, I guess I should get into the story. I went to the LA Business Journal because I was a USC student, which is in Los Angeles. And they wrote up um, an article on me maybe a month after I reached out. And the head, Jerry Sullivan, I don't know if he's still there, but the head of the LA Business Journal, he would ask me every single week to reach back out to him. 
he was like, oh, I haven't had a time to look at your pitch. Call me back next week. And then he kept doing it, kept doing it. And I was like, how long does it take to read a fucking email? So he was just kind of blowing me off. But I reached out to one of the writers that wrote about entrepreneurship profiles. And she, she found me a good fit in an article that would go live in two to three weeks. And it was basically the top 20 entrepreneurs in Los Angeles in their 20s. And this was into their print edition. Again, print edition is way better than the online version. I don't care what anyone says. The people that say that uh, online version is the one that matters, that's absolutely not true. It's much harder to get into the print version of Forbes or Entrepreneur. Sometimes you have to pay um, because that's how they make money sometimes through PR agencies. But print is a big deal. And we got in there for free again. And then I went out to... Uh, I also went to the LA Business Journal, not LA, Atlanta Business Journal, and they had no interest in writing anything on me. He was like, you should go into PR instead of entrepreneurship. And I was like, the fuck are you, again, you're going to meet some assholes along the way that are just going to be dicks for absolutely no reason because they're in one position of power. Don't let that discourage you. But also, there's going to be people that say, if you want to be featured in Forbes, be a contributor. That's not the same thing of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting features written about you, not you becoming a contributor and trying to squeeze your story into every article you write about. That's not the same thing I'm talking about. Don't be a contributor. We're talking solely about how to get your story written about. And then I want to talk about the trickle effect. Once you get into a big article like a Forbes or a Business Insider or anything press related that's in print, the LA Business Journal or LA Times, you really don't know what the trickle effect is going to be. For example, the Business Insider article aired and then a week later, someone from the number one AM radio station in Los Angeles talked about my story for about 20 minutes on air. And that spike in sales was the most intense I've ever seen because it was $10,000 in a single hour. And I've never seen anything like that because it wasn't to my knowledge. I woke up one day and my phone just started blowing up and I had no idea what I did. I was like, did another article go live? I started like Googling, starting checking my emails, making sure nothing went up. And then I got this one email randomly saying that they heard my story on um, this AM show and I looked it up and then I reached out to them and I just said, thank you guys so much for talking about me. How did you find out about my story? And they just said, we saw your article on business insider and we couldn't get you on air. So we just talked about it. And then they pulled audio from me, from my YouTube channel. They're like, this is what Andrew cause had to say about whatever. And then they just started playing my YouTube channel. So That's also another point is number one, you don't know the trickle down effect and you never know how important putting content out is, especially audio and video, because that was really important. Had I not put out YouTube videos, had I not put out my entire Forbes interview onto YouTube, if you check it, it's only audio and it's the whole podcast interview with Ryan Robinson. It's all there. And they use that to basically make my first uh, radio appearance. So it's really important. You don't know the trickle down effects. Getting into big publications will get you opportunities and things you don't even know. I had no idea that was going to happen. And that's what getting features can do. Not only can you put into your Instagram bio where you've been featured in or put on your homepage where you've been featured in, but it's the actual reach. You don't know who who's going to be reading it, who you're going to be reaching. And again, I'm just going to repeat this. The first one is always the hardest. And I'm not talking about the first one as a whole, um, for example, Daily Trojan or your local newspaper or maybe your local magazine, which I was all in, I'm talking about your first major one. That one's going to be really damn hard. But as soon as you get the first big one from those big, I should also add Business Insider and Forbes, they don't have this back end contributor website. So if someone reaches out to you, if anyone ever reaches out to you and says, I can get you into BuzzFeed, MSNBC, uh, USA Today, anything, anything like that, and they say for $500 per feature or $100 or $50, whatever they say, if they say that, 
simply ask them, is it going to be indexed? This is one lesson that I didn't know back then. And you should know this. If you have to pay for a feature, it's going to be a fake feature. Okay. And for example, if an entrepreneur reaches out to you and for some reason they say that they've been, I've had, this is a personal experience. Someone reached out to me and they're like, how did you get into Forbes? And then I was like, have you been featured anywhere? And he said, oh yeah, I've been featured in Inc and entrepreneur and da 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 all this other bullshit. And I was like, really? If you Google their name and nothing comes up, they were paying for fake press. And what it is, is there's a back end contributor platform to certain places like entrepreneur magazine and like MSNBC. And what it is, is basically they put just shit on there. And then the entrepreneur can say, oh, we've been featured in whatever. And then that person that wrote it, he gets to keep the money, but no one fucking ever sees it. If you ever Google the name, no one's going to fucking see it. It doesn't exist. Okay. Do not fucking do that. Don't be a fucking fake entrepreneur that pays for all this bullshit. And it's not even true. If someone reaches out to you and wants money for press, chances are it's fucking fake. Okay. But if you reach out or if someone reaches out to you and they're a staff writer, they're not going to ask for money. And that article is going to get a shit ton of views. It's going to be indexed, which just means if someone Googles your name, the article is going to pop up. That's basically what it means. If you Google Andrew Cause and Business Insider, it's going to come up. If it doesn't, that means it's fucking bullshit. Just don't fall into that trap. That kid that reached out to me saying he was featured in X, Y, and Z, he probably paid thousands of dollars in fake press and any real winner, any real entrepreneur that would see that or be told that and double checks his shit, they're going to know exactly what he did. And now you guys know how to double check someone. If it's print, it's real as shit. If it's written by a staff writer, it's real as shit. But if you Google their name and whatever source that they're talking about and nothing shows up, they got, they got stuck in that contributor platform that is just such bullshit. I, I can't believe that that even exists. But in regards to Forbes and Business Insider, those contributor platforms don't exist at all. So there's no fake press with those two specific places. So if you're reaching out to them and you get an article with them, there's no bullshit there. Those are the two business media sources that do not play those games. They don't try to make money for anyone there. Um, so yeah, the first one is the hardest. So you have to fight for that one. And no one said this to me when I was approaching it, but I knew that that would be true. I knew that the first one was going to be a battle. So I was in it. I was like, if I need to email 10,000 people and just get my story out there. And like, even if all of them said no, and they would just give me insight on when to come back, whether it's more sales, more followers, or my pitch was bad, whatever they would say, I would take into account, but I knew I just needed to get the first one and then I'd circle back around with that first one and get a shit ton. And that's exactly what happened. So the first one's the hardest, just focus on getting that one. But again, you have to have a story that needs to be told. So don't go out looking for press if you're making $100 a month or $1,000 a month. It's not going to happen. Make sure that you have a story that needs to be told and then it's going to be fucking easy. It's going to be like cutting warm butter if you have a story that needs to be told. If you don't, you can spend three months working on it and you're not going to get any press. So think, maybe ask some business professors if you have a story that needs to be told. Maybe go to the communication school at your university and say, do you think my story needs to be told? Does it have a chance in the press? Also, if you get published in your local newspaper, if you get published in your school newspaper, it's an indication that you have a good story and it should be told, okay? So that those are these are all kind of like probing steps that get you to the point where you get these really massive features. Um, another thing that I should add is an interesting story that kind of piggybacks on what I said earlier of if they say no, ask questions on when to come back, how to pitch better, etc. I emailed the chief editor of Entrepreneurship Magazine, Jason Pfeiffer, and he responded with an entire essay on how to come back around, 
how to pitch again. And then what happened is I wrote him an essay back with more questions on when to circle back around, what stories are they looking for, all of these things. And I'm just going to summarize what he said. And it's basically, there's no amount of sales and no amount of followers. And it doesn't matter your age when you reach out for press. It's all about whether you have a story to be told. That's basically what he told me. And this is the chief editor, Entrepreneurship Magazine. He provided me so much insight in those maybe 10 email exchanges that we had. And again, don't be scared to ask questions. If someone says no, don't just leave it at that. There's going to be some assholes that say, no, I'm not writing about this. Or of course, there's going to be people like that. But the ones that are willing to help, that answer your questions, that help you pitch better, really dig into those people and then keep them around. Don't just be like, oh, he said no, fuck him. Save them. Build a, build a good relationship so that one day when you do have whatever it is they're looking for, you can circle back, okay? So don't just burn bridges because they said no the first time. But when you do find the right people, it's going to happen really, really quick. So if you have a good story, you're going to email someone a cold email. And then, again, you don't need, you don't need connections in this world. If you're going to hustle and grind and you're sending it from your .edu email and you're sending out really good emails, you're going to end up finding the right person. They're going to have an interview probably that day or the next day. And then you're going to be having your first major feature the following day. It's going to happen quick when you find the right person. That kind of does it for this episode. And because this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, because it was such an exhilarating ride to do it back then, because You have this crown of business achievement of Forbes. And I remember the night before I officially got the first one, which was really the second interview I did, but it was the first Forbes feature. I was damn near the verge of tears because it's just such an achievement in business. And I built it up to be something so big and it was big at the moment, but it's just an exciting ride. And I hope that some of these tips and how I approached it help someone kind of realize that you might not be ready for press, focus on success, and then focus on press. And it is really fun, and you do have to do it creatively and not just mass blast people and spam people. I also didn't hit one thing. The best way to reach out is through email. I remember I tried to be creative, and I was like, oh, entrepreneurs do things different. They are creative. They would DM someone when everyone else is emailing them. They would send them a message on Twitter instead of emailing them. That's not the case. The All of my features have come from email, from cold emails. Not from connections on LinkedIn or Instagram DMs. The Instagram DMs didn't really get any responses and I only tested it a few times with maybe 100 people. So I would say email is the best way to do it if you do it. Cold emails, if you know someone, fuck, you can try, but I'm telling you, cold emails, if you show that you care and you have a story, is going to fucking work. You just have to pound it. You have to play the numbers game. The numbers game is how many shots do you need to take before you hit that home run. If you play, if you only take 100 swings and you miss all, you lost. But if you plan on doing 1,000, one of those emails is going to hit, right? One of them is going to hit if you do thousands and you have a good story to be told. So that's going to do it all for today. Tomorrow is episode 12, and we're going to talk about 18 to 28, why it's the golden window for entrepreneurship, as I strongly believe for numerous reasons. But that does it up for the ease of press at an early age. When you're young, again, I've said this in an episode before, if you're making 100K and you're 14, you're going to get a feature. If you're making 100K and you're 45, you're not getting fucking shit. So the younger you are, the more challenges you had to overcome, the more story worthy it is. This is what features are. It's telling a story that needs to be told. The younger you are, the simply easier it is to get features. So being in college, you're balancing a college education at a prestigious university. You have tons of responsibilities already. And on top of that, you have a huge social media brand that you founded with your own money and you're paying for college yourself. That's a challenge, 
That's a story that needs to be told to inspire other people that go into college that they can balance two really big tasks at the same time and succeed at both. So it's really easy to get press when you're young. And even if you have minor success that may seem major then, it is press worthy, okay? So I hope these lessons help someone, help someone know when to start approaching their crown of business achievement of their Forbes feature. And yeah, I hope this helps. Thank you guys so much for watching. Order the Brains Box if you want the best brain nutrition in the world. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Happy hunting. Peace. Tell me what you see when you see me. All I see is dollar, dollar, dollar bill. Tell me what you see when you see me.